This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 755, recorded on May 13th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. How's it going this week, Daniel? Um, you know, it's it's mixed, right? Um, numbers are numbers are getting better in New York, right? We finally the other day got below less than two thousand people in hospital. Uh, which is quite, you know, imagine at one point we had um, more than that dying per day, right? Now we're less than 2,000 in hospital. Um, so it, it's amazing the way our benchmark is changing. We're still seeing 20, 30, 40 people dying a day, but that's not 2,000. Um, still had another one of my patients die last night. So we're still, we're still losing people. We're still having people die of COVID here. Um, but I think people are seeing there's a change. I mean, a lot of the hospitals are pointing out 99% of the people that are getting admitted now are people that never got a vaccine. So that's, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people who would rather take their chances, not do well, right? Um, this is the lottery that you lose. But let me start off with our quotation, and then we'll go right into this. Um, and I'm going to start with a quotation from Nelson Mandela. There is no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. Um, so we're going to be talking actually quite a bit about children today. And there's been a lot of news about um kids and masks. So we'll try to hit on everything. And a lot of stuff is hot off the press, right? So um, I was listening um, I was listening to the, the latest TWIV right before this. I do listen to all the other uh, TWIV and Twix episodes, by the way. Um, so some comment, if Daniel's listening, I'm always listening, right? You know, it's like <laughs> Fauci on the couch or something. So, um, <laughs> but uh, let's start off with, um, we won't get right to the hot news, but we'll start with some background. On May 6th, um, Moderna reported um, phase two, three teen cove study of mRNA one, two, seven, three in adolescents. Um, the phase two, three study of mRNA one, two, seven, three in adolescents ages 12 to 17, uh, completed enrollment in the U S. Um, we got initial analysis here of 3,235 participants randomized two to one. Um, and we're seeing here vaccine efficacy of 96% um, in the zero negative participants who received at, one, at least one injection, right? Um, so the analysis included 12 cases starting 14 days after the first dose and based on the CDC definition of COVID-19, which requires one COVID-19 symptom uh, paired with a nasopharyngeal swab or saliva sample uh, positive for SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR. So just a little bit more about this, right? Just to give, this is the Moderna sort of balance to the data that um, we're going to talk about with Pfizer. So we're going to talk about what Pfizer is now doing. Um, but in the study, the median duration for follow-up in this analysis was 35 days following the second dose. Um, the vaccine, the Moderna vaccine was very well tolerated in these adolescents. Um, majority of the, um, of the, say adverse events were mild, moderate, um, no serious safety concerns. So what, what, what are these things? Um, some sight pain, right? It hurts to get poked with a needle. People did, did reconfirm that fire is hot. Um, they did also, um, report headache, um, fatigue, uh, muscle pain. Um, there was some chills. Um, so, uh, the company reported that they're going to continue to collect the data here. Um, and we'll, we can look forward to, um, the Moderna vaccine um, in the future also requesting expansion down uh, to cover adolescents if the rest of the data is in line with what we're seeing here. Um, what about kids younger? What about down to six months? Uh, there's also the Kid Cove study um, of the Moderna vaccine in younger children. Um, this is ongoing and this actually is down to six months of age. So this will cover those six months of age up to 11 years, that's ongoing. Um, just to predict the future, you know, and this probably will not be Moderna first, it'll be Pfizer, Moderna, et cetera. Um, we're thinking we're not gonna be expanding down to these younger ages um, until probably September, but we'll see as we go forward with that. Daniel, can I ask you, um, 
the, the numbers are very small. And we puzzled about that on TWIV. It, it, why are they so low for the adolescent studies? Yeah. Um, you know, it, there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is we're just sort of slightly moving, moving the bar here, right? So normally we think of vaccine studies of being about 30,000 people, minimum duration of two months. Um, and so, right, we've, we've had now millions, right, of people, 16, 17, 18, sort of just right above here. So you're just sort of moving that down a little bit. Um, and you're basically saying, is there any sort of a different signal here? Right. So this really builds on the 30,000. You couldn't do this by itself. You couldn't say, oh, I'm just going to do a, you know, in this case, 3,235 participant study and get a vaccine licensed based on that. So it's really this is data building on the other data. And actually, no, that's I'm glad you bring up Vince, because I get this question all the time. Parents say like, but it's only like 3,000 here, 2,000 here. We're only talking about 5,000 people in these studies so far. We're actually talking about millions of people and we're just moving moving that bar a little bit. You know, what is physiologically the difference between a 16-year-old and a 15-year-old? Uh, probably, as we're seeing, not, not very much, except, boy, this looks like an age when we get a really robust immune response. Is that good, Benson? <laughs> Try to see if there's more questions. Yeah. So, I mean, you say millions, but the, the trial was, you know, tens of thousands. So are we are we following people who are being vaccinated in some way? Yeah. So there's there's two main ways that we're following people who've been vaccinated. Right. And I think um, Pfizer actually is the vaccine that has the most doses out there. Um, well over 100 million here in the U.S. alone. Um, and there's two ways we follow that. So one is is the VAERS, which is a sort of a passive, anyone can report. Um, but there's also active, um, we call phase four, where we continue to follow um, a large cohort of these people who've been vaccinated. So um, it's a combination. The VAERS is the, the broadest, right? And as we saw, even something as rare as with the clotting with J&J, something that you know is maybe one in a million or so, maybe one in 100,000, um, we can pick that up. So um, we have actually a tremendous amount of safety data in, um, you know, in the age group just right above 15. So 16, 17, 18. Okay, great. Thank you. Transmission. Um, you know, as I like to say, um, COVID-19 most commonly spreads during close contact. COVID-19 can sometimes be spread by airborne transmission. People seem very excited that that's been um, added. Um, uh, CD COVID-19 spreads less commonly through contact with contaminated surfaces, right? And that was where it said maybe one in every 10,000 case um, is due to contact. So we've really moved a lot away uh, from the hygiene theater. Um, so this last week, I have to say the whole outdoor transmission topic um, heated up. This is a moving target um, and many are actually taking issue I'm going to say appropriately so, with this number that's being bantied about of less than 10%. Um, now, now, I for a while have quoted um, that your risk of getting COVID outdoors versus indoor is about 20 times um, less likely outdoors, right? So wouldn't that put us more down around less than 5%? Um, now, I want to say there there isn't necessarily new science here that everyone's getting um, sort of excited about. It's really rather a reaction to the updated CDC camp guidance where masking outdoors is recommended as a baseline with certain exceptions. Um, and, and we talked about um, this CDC guidance um, that was updated by the CDC on April 24th. And what what did they say? What, what got sort of a strong reaction is they said all people in camp facilities should wear masks at all times with exceptions. All right, so what are those exceptions? Um, and we talked about this. It could be the exceptions could be certain people or certain settings or activities. Certain people, they said, children two and younger, a person with a disability who cannot safely wear or remove a mask if necessary, anyone who has trouble breathing or is unconscious, right? So we're, we're saying certain people um, are exempted from this, um, but also certain settings and activities, right? And so what are those? Eating, drinking, swimming, napping, involved in activities that could make your mask wet during high intensity activities where a mask would create difficulties breathing. Um, and now add to this vaccinated, right? So that, that's going to bring us back to outdoor transmission. Um, but before we jump into that, um, breaking news, right? Um, here on TWIV, um, 
Uh, I don't know if you heard this, Vincent, but today, Dr. Walensky at the CDC announced in Thursday, the day that we're recording this episode, that people fully vaccinated against COVID-19 do not need to wear masks or practice social distancing indoors or outdoors, except under certain circumstances. Um, this was then echoed by Anthony Fauci. Um, now, there certainly are special considerations if a person cannot mount an effective immune response to the vaccine. Um, I was meeting with a gentleman on Tuesday, 89 years old. Um, he has an immunodeficiency where he has to get um, intravenous um, immunoglobulins on a regular basis. <clears throat> he has some um, ongoing viral issues. Yeah, that, that's not a man who's going to go, you know, to the ball game with his mask off or be in a large indoor setting with his mask off. So um, this is certainly great news for people that have a, um, a healthy immune system, people who can mount a proper response to the vaccines. Um, I think that um, this is reasonable. I think it's responsible. I think the science is now here and clear on just how incredible protection a person gets when they're vaccinated. Um, and I think this is gonna challenge some of the comments and concerns about quote unquote herd immunity or community immunity. Um, if you are vaccinated, right? We learn things that masks reduce risk by 80%. Uh, maybe being outdoors reduces risk by 95% your risk of ending up in the hospital or dying of COVID is reduced even more, most dramatically by vaccination. Um, and I think that the science is now here. And, and I think as people, you know, beat up the CDC a little, um, the CDC gives us evidence-based, reliable guidance. And we've been thinking the science has been mounting. It's finally here. And the CDC did not wait. And they stepped forward and um, endorsed these recommendations. Um, but let's get back to outdoor transmission. Um, you know, as I said, this is not something new, but let's go through what the data is when we hear this less than 10%. So back in November, um, there was a systematic review published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, Outdoor Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and Other Respiratory Viruses, a systematic review. So these authors conducted a systematic review of peer-reviewed papers indexed in PubMed, Embased, and Web of Science, and preprints um, in Europe PMC through 12 August 2020 uh, that described cases of human transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, reports of other respiratory virus transmission were included for reference. Now, um, I think it's getting nice when I listen to the other TWIBs that we're getting back to peer-reviewed literature. So um, uh, hopefully in the future, all of these analysis will only include peer-reviewed, um, properly fetid research. Um, but the authors here reported um, that based on five identified studies, they found a low proportion of SARS-CoV-2 infections occurred outdoors. And they say less than 10%. Um, and then here's where you get that number. The odds of indoor transmission were very high compared to outdoors 18.7 times, right? And to give a uh, confidence interval to that. So, right, that's that I say 20, and I'm rounding the 18.7 up to 20. Um, now, I will say though, if you, you know, if you don't just, read the results. But if you actually go through this whole article, um, and this will be posted, I think, on Parasites Without Borders so that you can actually do this and start looking at the, the tables, you'll actually see there's two really large studies in this analysis. Um, one that involved 10,926 cases and another that involved 7,322. And in those two large studies, the number was actually less than 1%, right? So it is true that the risk is less than 10%, but based on the two large studies that were included, it was less than one. Now there was a small study with 103 work-related cases. Um, in that study, they suggested maybe 5%. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to look through the data here. Yes, it is less than 10%. It may actually be less than 1%. So um, if you're outdoors, um, you, you've probably reduced your risk by at least 95%. Um, people get vaccinated, as we're seeing, really goes down even farther. And that's what we're hearing from the CDC. So effective is vaccination that it is even 
more effective than wearing a mask and being outdoors and protecting you. Um, so I think the evidence is really compelling that being vaccinated and outdoors without masks is really low risk all around. And as the CDC is saying, boy, if you're vaccinated, maybe being indoors is fine too. Um, now that vaccine eligibility has dropped to age 12, um, this is really going to leave us a small donut hole for the summer going into this, right? The kids age 3 to 11, um, you combine testing, drops in communal, community prevalence, um, all the many exceptions um, that are sort of built into when the mask can come off. I think we're really headed in a positive direction here, testing. Um, never miss an opportunity to test. There's been a little discussion um, and we're seeing it in our urgent care and primary care centers. People are embracing those tests at home. Um, I wish the price point was better. I mean, it would be wonderful if there was some way of, uh, you know, instead of these wide ranges that you're seeing, you know, if they were a dollar a test, uh, they look like they're about twelve fifty a test. Some people are charging 35 a test. Um, I guess if you buy them in bulk at a thousand at a time, you can get that, you know, lower price point. Um, but we're actually getting, um, you know, parents are now doing this at home. Um, their child wakes up, doesn't feel well. Um, they wake up, don't feel well. Um, they do the test. Um, sometimes that test is positive. They come in for um, for advice, for guidance. So um, I just think the access to tests is fantastic. Um, but boy, get vaccinated and then you won't have to worry quite as much. <laughs> All right. Active vaccination. Never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. This is the big news that I think everyone was waiting for. Um, this week was the FDA expansion of the EUA for Pfizer down to age 12. Um, on Monday evening, May 10th, um, 6 p.m., uh, the FDA announced that they had expanded the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for the prevention of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, to include adolescents 12 through 15 years of age. Um, I was very happy about the timing because I was going to appear on TV. I did appear on TV the following morning at, um, you know, Tuesday a.m. And I was going to discuss this expansion. So it was really good timing that they squeezed that in there, squeezed that in there for me. Um, now, what did the FDA have to say about this decision? Um, and they actually said, so March 2020, March 1st, 2020, 20, through April 30, 2021, approximately 1.5 million COVID-19 cases in individuals 11 to 17 years of age um, had been reported to the Centers for Disease Control. The FDA has determined that Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine has met the statutory criteria to amend the EUA and that the known and potential benefits of this vaccine in individuals 12 years of age and older outweigh the known and potential risks supporting the vaccine's use in this population. Um, so we discussed the data on a prior TWIV. Um, we discussed some data today on Moderna, but in the past we discussed this study with over um, 2,000 participants. So the available safety data to support the EUA in adolescents down to 12 included 2,260 participants aged 12 through 15 enrolled in an ongoing, so it's ongoing, they keep looking at these kids, randomized um, placebo-controlled clinical trial in the United States. Of these 1,131 adolescents who received the vaccine, um, they were followed for a minimum, right? It's got to do at least two months, which they did. Um, and, um, and in this analysis, among participants without evidence of prior infection with SARS-CoV-2, no cases of COVID-19 occurred. So zero, 100% protection. Um, now, on Wednesday, the ACIP voted unanimously. Um, I have to say, like, I, I don't know why I still get um, emotional about this, but I do. I mean, this this was a huge, you know, actually brought a tear to my eye when I heard not only the, the votes coming in, but the comments afterwards. But the committee um, unanimously voted to recommend the Pfizer vaccine for adolescents 12 to 15. And there were really several important comments. Um, and it was really interesting to hear some of the comments post vote. Now, Apoorva Mandevilli at the New York Times did a really nice job of capturing the comments, which I appreciate it. I was driving while I was listening and I was trying to decide, should I pull over and jot these things down? So um, fortunately, um, they were actually put in print. Um, Grace, Dr. Grace Lee, a member of the committee and professor of pediatrics at Stanford University commented that 
sometimes we lose the importance of children and adolescents in the midst of pandemic. There's such a focus on older adults in particular. Um, Dr. Maldonado reinforced that children may be at lower risk, but they are not at no risk. And she pointed out, while children's risk of severe illness is low compared with that of adults, the coronavirus has infected more than 1.5 million children, sent more than 13,000 children to hospitals, uh, more than our hospitals for flu in an average year, according to the data collected by the CDC. Um, there was a comment that it is currently, COVID-19 is currently one of the top 10 causes of death in children since the pandemic began. And remember, this is with full lockdown, with virtual schools, um, with, in the last year, camps and all these other activities shut down. Um, I think it's really important to remember that these numbers were what we observed with a rather draconian lockdown with school closures, virtual learning, masks, everything else. Things that I remember last February, some of our health experts saying this will never happen in America. Well, it happened in America. And despite that, we still had this impact. Another little bit of bit of good news, right? I think this is great news that we're going to be expanding this opportunity to get vaccinated down. I'll let everyone know my my 15-year-old son, Barnaby, is scheduled. Um, it'll be Friday evening. So when this drops, he'll already have had his first vaccine. So I'll be able to give some updates. Maybe we'll even post a, uh, uh, a picture if he's willing. Uh, I have to check with my wife first. Um, but we learned about temperature stability, right? That's always a challenge with a lot of these vaccines, particularly, right, we think about the Pfizer with these thermal shippers. Um, and we heard from Pfizer that they actually have an updated formulation, which may allow six months in the fridge. Well, Moderna is always right there with them. And they recently announced ongoing development data related to the current formulation um, that could support a three-month refrigerated shelf life for the vaccine um, and also alternative formates, formats to facilitate easier distribution to doctor's offices and other smaller settings. And I think this is critical, and I've talked a little bit about this, is some people are happy to go to these sort of large vaccination sites, the state-run sites, that's where Barnaby's going, um, but um, a lot of people want to have that conversation with their physician, uh, particularly a lot of parents want to have that conversation with the pediatrician. Um, what they've done here in New York State, and I, I think it's really ingenious, is you know the, the Pfizer vaccines come with over a thousand in this thermal shipper. Um, not every pediatrician um, office is ready to accept a thousand vaccines. Um, and all the commitments of getting them out. So there's sort of a cooperative that they've arranged where um, several pediatrician groups can work together to you know, each accept a certain number of the vaccines. They get popped in a fridge, you got five days. So basically you're Monday through Friday to get those vaccines into arms. So um, gonna be a little bit of uh, flexibility and thinking outside the box to get this done so that we get to that next level of people who, who wanna have a conversation, wanna ask questions. I'm gonna move to the viral symptom phase, right? the time for monitoring and monoclonals. Um, and we have some data on NSAIDs. So things like ibuprofen, naproxen, um, and we have some reassuring data on the ability to safely use the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen, naproxen um, in COVID-19. Um, and actually, I'd say this is huge. This does, may not seem huge, but when a person is suffering through that viral symptomatic phase of um, COVID or even starting to move into the early inflammatory, it can be miserable. And it is amazing um, what an Aleve, um, a naproxen, a couple ibuprofen can do, um, particularly in the evening when that person is trying to get some rest. So early on, people may remember, there was a little bit of concern uh, as a letter sent. Um, but this article um, in The Lancet Rheumatology non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use and outcomes of COVID-19 in the ISARIC Clinical Characterization Protocol UK cohort, a matched prospective co cohort study, right? And so the authors reported on the results of this prospective multi-center cohort study that included patients admitted to hospital with a confirmatory or highly suspected SARS-CoV-2 infection between January 17th 
and August 10th, 2020. Um, the primary outcome was in hospital mortality um, and secondary outcomes were disease severity at presentation, admission to critical care, receipt of invasive ventilation, receipt of non-invasive ventilatory support, use of supplementary oxygen, acute kidney injury. And now what did they find? Um, so this was a pretty robust study. They enrolled 78,674 patients across 255 healthcare facilities in England, Scotland, and Wales, where there be dragons. In this cohort, 4,211 patients were recorded as taking systemic NSAIDs before admission to hospital. Um, and they report that the NSAID use was not associated um, with worse in hospital mortality, not associated with critical care admission, not associated with the requirement for invasive ventilation, requirement for non-invasive ventilation, requirement for oxygen, or kidney injury. Um, so basically, NSAID use is safe in um, COVID-19. Passive vaccination, um, it actually looks like we're moving closer to full approval or licensure um, here as the data is such that recently the FDA said that the data is currently so compelling um, that they no longer agree with conducting placebo-controlled trials here in the United States. Um, basically, this is considered the standard of care and something that should be offered to patients. Um, a little bit of a challenge for the intramuscular, subcutaneous, um, and other monoclonal antibody therapies that are trying to come to market, trying to get their trials. Um, we also have um, ongoing trials looking at using these agents um, to protect contacts um, and high-risk individuals unable to produce their own antibody. So things are moving with monoclonals. I um, actually was at the gym today wearing a mask, you know, I don't know if I need to anymore, right? This was before um, Dr. Wolinski made the pronouncement. Um, we'll have to see when the rules change. Um, but actually seeing an advertisement on um, the television. Um, so pretty exciting stuff that the information is getting out there. We need to use these more. Now, early inflammatory phase, right? If room air saturations are less than 94%, um, that's when we have data that steroids, dexamethasone, from the recovery trial, six milligrams, once a day for 10 days improves outcomes and saves life. Um, there are certain situations where people are actually using little higher doses a little bit longer. Um, but here's where I wanna throw in a little bit of caution here. Um, people following the news about India have probably heard about the black fungus um, or what is more properly called rhino cerebral mucormycosis. Um, and there was a nice case series published in the journal of laryngology laryngology and otology. Um, and this was post-coronavirus disease mucormycosis, a deadly addition to the pandemic spectrum. Um, and um, I don't know if people are familiar with this. I actually have seen a number of cases of this in my career and actually a number of cases when I was uh, spending time um, in India. Uh, here, the authors describe 23 cases and the association with diabetes overzealous use of steroids, use of broad spectrum antibiotics, I'll add, to treat a viral disease, and perhaps unclean oxygen delivery devices. Um, they have some great images in this article, disturbing images. Um, they're, they're, they're not the actual looking and seeing in the open mouth of a patient, that black escar, which is the fungus eating away. Um, but if you do, if you look inside the mouth, and um, I mentioned I spent some time in Tamil Nadu where I saw some cases in the Indian population of this, where you look inside the mouth and on the roof of the mouth, there's this black Escar, where the fungus is basically eating away the person's face and oral cavity. Um, it's truly horrific. Um, and I've even seen where it progresses and eats away the eye. Um, but this is really a caution. A break Remember, this is a viral disease. They do not need these broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, the steroids has somewhat of a benefit, um, but you do not keep these patients on steroids for three weeks. You don't give steroids and let the glucoses go really high. Um, so where we're seeing a lot of this in India, this is really, um, we'll say iatrogenic, which means we're, we're causing this. So we need to be a little bit careful here, please. Um, remdesivir, right, has some minor impact at huge expense, I like to say. Um, anticoagulation for hospitalized patients. Um, 
the science strongly recommends against HCQ at this point. I apologize, but that's where the where we are. There was a paper published in Nature Communications, Mortality Outcomes with Hydroxychloroquine and Chloroquine in COVID-19 from an International Collaborative Meta-Analysis of Randomized Trials. Um, and here, the authors presented a meta-analysis of ongoing, completed, or discontinued randomized control trials on hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine treatment for any COVID-19 patients. Um, they reported on all-cause mortality, um, and they, they looked at publications, preprints. Um, they even reached out to the investigators to get more information if needed. Um, looking through 63 trials were potentially eligible for inclusion. Um, they include 14 unpublished trials with 1,308 patients, uh, 14 publications preprints with 9,011 patients. They included the recovery and the WHO solidarity trials, which included 4,716 and 1,853 patients. Basically, just to say, the combined odds ratio on all-cause mortality for hydroxychloroquine was 1.11, for chloroquine, 1.77. Um, basically, they were reporting that treatment with hydroxychloroquine was associated with increased mortality. Um, so it looks like HCQ is associated with a 10% increase in mortality. I think we need to move past that. Um, oxygen and pulmonary support, antibiotics are not helpful for treating viral infections. And as I mentioned, the experience here can increase the risk of kidney failure, progression to dialysis, death, and increase the risk of opportunistic, opportunistic infections, which can harm or actually in some cases kill our patients. Um, we mentioned last time some data, tocilizumab added to steroids can improve outcomes and have a mortality benefit. Um, consider this early in patients not reporting, not responding to steroids is not something you want to wait to do. Um, and this is something which has now actually been added to the ID Society guidelines. Tail phase long COVID, post-COVID. Um, so our listeners may have heard that Dr. John Brooks, the chief medical officer for the CDC's COVID-19 um, responses, let it be known that there will be forthcoming guidance from the CDC on how healthcare providers can identify long COVID and manage long COVID. And there will likely be a specific ICD-10 code, a diagnosed code for long COVID. Um, and I was asked for some input on this guide and said, it really looks like they're doing a great job recognizing that not all patients have access to testing during the acute phase or test positive by serology um, when they come to medical attention. I expect that this guidance will likely focus on the multidisciplinary team approach uh, that many of our centers are finding so critical for meeting the needs of these patients. I also think it's really nice um, that this is kind of a new model. They're reaching out to some of these support groups. They're trying to get input from patients. Um, I know Survivor Corps has been asked um, to basically input on this. So um, I, I really think that this is going to be incredibly helpful for sharing the knowledge, uh, serving as an educational resource um, for all the many clinicians who are really stepping up and helping take care of these patients. And now I will finish by mentioning our fundraiser. So if you're not driving, stop what you're doing, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com um, and help us support Foundation International Medical Relief of Children. Um, this is an organization with sites throughout the world um, and the patients they care for are struggling, right? The young volunteers who usually go out to these sites, the financial support that they usually have um, to do all this tremendous work, it's not there. And if you look at these places, they have a couple sites in India they have sites in sub-Saharan Africa, sites in South America. They have sites in so many of these places that are being so hard hit with COVID. Um, please help us support them um, so that we can really go beyond our borders and help um, address these global issues. All right, time for some questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. First is from Pete. I have just sent money to a friend in India for oxygen, $500 for a cylinder, 200 for a fill that would probably help two people. I'm thinking monoclonals, monoclonals would be a better option. Any idea how much and how to get them there? Yeah, so these, these are challenges. I, it's just that's amazing that that amount of money is being taken um, for cylinders and these other things. And it really frustrating that there was not better preparation for what's going on in India right now. Um, I was actually told by someone, um, I have a, I work with actually a lot of Indian 
uh, clinicians. Um, and that remdesivir, for instance, was negotiated so at least remdesivir is only about fifteen or twenty dollars a dose in in India. So that that's better than three thousand dollars for a course here in the United States. Um, but access to the monoclonals is difficult. There actually is a bit of a black market where the monoclonals. I don't know how they're actually being initially procured, but they seem to be being sent over to India. So. Um, you know, I'm not going to endorse the black market. Um, but yeah, when you start looking at these price points, when someone's paying that amount of money for, for oxygen, um, then some of these other costs just um, don't seem quite as high. So um, if anything, I think this just highlights what a, what a tragedy is going on over there. David writes, universities are starting to implement vaccine mandates for their students since a lot of students come from overseas. The question keeps coming up. What do we do about students vaccinated with non-FDA approved Vaccines, AstraZeneca, Sinovac, Sputnik, Covaxin, etc. Revaccinate them? Seems kind of extreme given the existing manufacturing shortages. Accept non-FDA approved vaccines in the context of a mandate or just some of them? Is there formal guidance? Obviously, there has to be a line drawn somewhere, but I'm not sure who draws this line. Yeah, I've actually seen that the CDC is starting to put together a guidance here. Um, and what they are saying basically is if it's U.S. FDA approved vaccines, all right, that counts. Um, but then you get into something like, well, what about AstraZeneca? Um, so it, that's the current guidance. The current guidance, if somebody has vaccines that are FDA approved, considers effective, um, then that can be, you know, considered um, as adequately fully vaccinated, you know, the same criteria two weeks after the, the last shot in the series. Um, but so far, the rules are if a person got vaccines that our FDA has not fully reviewed, has not fully endorsed um, or licensed or given an EUA, right, we're in the world of EUAs, then we actually have to go ahead and revaccinate. And I, I think this is tough because I'm going to say in the next sentence, we have an abundance of vaccines here in the United States. We have the capability to do that. Um, that's a little bit of an embarrassment, right? When we're talking about places like India where, ooh, those vaccines um, would make a huge difference. And what is the cheapest way to keep someone from dying from COVID-19? It's to vaccinate them. Tiffany writes, I have a coworker who has gout. She had a terrible flare up about a week after getting her first vaccination. Is there any chance these events are connected? Her doctor told her they probably are, but it seems weird to me. She found this article on Podiatry Today connecting gout attacks to vaccinations. I was just wondering what you think. I don't want any more reasons for people not to get vaccinated if they aren't based on fact. Yeah, so, um, you know, it would not surprise me, right? We, we often, well, as an infectious disease doctor, we often see um, inflammatory triggers um, related to to gout flares, right? Um, and you can imagine how bad that gout flare would be if you actually had COVID. And I've certainly seen patients who come in with COVID. I've seen patients that come in with pneumonia, urinary tract infections. Um, you know, the, the, the gout um, is something that is driven by an inflammatory process um, and something like a vaccine potentially could trigger that. It very easily treated, right? You treat it with ibuprofen or Aleve or a colchicine, right? We have many, many therapeutics for this. Um, and, and, you know, I think that we need to be honest, right? Um, and this was something mentioned on the last TWIV is people get vaccines, they might have joint pain, they might have muscle pain. Um, it, it might be more than just that 24 hours. A colleague of mine actually had really bad vertigo, world spinning for several days after a vaccine. So um, there can be side effects. Why are we recommending these, these, these products with these horrible side effects? Um, it's because you know what's really horrible? Getting COVID-19. What's really horrible is dying of COVID-19. What's really horrible is having a breathing tube put down into your trachea because you got COVID-19 and didn't get vaccinated. So we always talk about the risk benefits. Boy, the risk and harmful potentialities of not being vaccinated. That's why we're vaccinating everyone. Lindsay writes, is there any evidence that people with a previous history of autoimmune platelet disorders like immune or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura are at increased risk of CVST from an adenovirus vectored SARS-CoV-2 vaccine? Or if given one of those vaccines, should someone with such a history be monitored for signs of CVST more closely than someone who didn't? 
Yeah, you know, that's a great question, right? Because we we sort of have this knee-jerk reaction that, well, boy, if you've had a problem like that in the past, that, oh, you're someone who should be at higher risk, we would think. What has been shocking, right? We continue to track this, right? Um, we continue to see, you know, that the rare uh, CVST associated with, with J&J. I'm going to say that. I think there's a connection there. I think we're all comfortable saying that. Um, rare, as it continues to be. Um, but we are, interesting enough, not seeing this connection, not seeing it occur in people people with prior disorders, as you've described, even though that would have been the population we would think about seeing it in. Um, so no, this group is not at any higher risk. This continues to be incredibly rare. Because it is so rare, any intervention we might do is more likely to do harm than just watchful waiting. All right. The last one, Daniel, we read on TWIV and we thought actually you should answer it because we didn't have an answer. This is from Haley, who is a 26-year-old healthy woman who got a Pfizer vaccine, both doses, got a lot of side effects, and many of them lasting a long time. She now has daily headaches, muscle and joint pain, can't exercise. Her doctors don't know what to do. She's regretting having gotten the vaccine. She says, please help. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this echoes what I was saying before, is that um, for not everyone, is it just, oh, I felt bad for 24 hours, or I was sort of fortunate I barely noticed that I was getting my vaccination. So um, some individuals, um, like is being described here, um, can have wrist or joint pain, they can have muscle pain, and sometimes that can last for several weeks. Um, we're usually recommending that uh, people take um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines for these. Um, and this tends to last weeks. We are not seeing um, so far, right, that this turns into anything long-term. I understand the the frustration and the regret here. Um, but if you are having difficulty, I mean, that's why we we set up a lot of these centers to try to help people. Um, you know, and as I think a lot of our listeners know, I'm always happy to, to answer questions and um, to potentially step in and, and help in a situation like this. So have your doctors reach out um, and I'm happy to hopefully help guide you through this process. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 62 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone, be safe. 